from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's coming up. K-State's Dan O'Brien talking about the USDA's cautious approach to factoring in late-season crop production problems in its latest grain supply and demand report out yesterday. Following then, an inside look at what's happening in USDA food safety policies. That from the head of the USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service, Mindy Brashears. She was a guest speaker here on the K-State campus this week. Later, K-State's Jeff Whitworth advising you wheat growers to be scouting your fields for army worm and army cutworm activity in your emerging stands. And with the latest on the Kansas agricultural weather beat, K-State's Mary Knapp. All that directly ahead on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today, and good to have you aboard once again. Opening up our Friday edition, our look at the grain markets, and hashing over the USDA's World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Report on Crop Production and Grain Stocks, released yesterday morning. Dan O'Brien standing by, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. Right out, Dan, you want to make the point here, you say, that the USDA is conservative in its adjustments on new crop production potential. Yes, the USDA took information as of October 1st, and as they have consistently done in this year, first in the August report, then the September report, now again in this one, they have uh, front and center stated that they're assuming normal conditions to the end of the year from the point in time of the surveys. And for... um, crops in the northern corn belt, uh, they're not accounting for any uh, delayed development or, as we speak, some of the cold freezing temperatures that could impact late corn and late soybeans off in uh, those northern corn belt areas and just depends on the degree to which temperatures reach the south. So so the USDA uh, pretty hesitant, quite loath actually to, to make any major adjustments. So the, the numbers crop size wise that came out of this report were well for the size of the corn crop in particular were higher than what the market was expecting and because of that by the time you take this, the production numbers into the supply demand balance sheets and the ending stocks numbers were not adjusted lower as much as as had been thought i i think the big issue is for when you look at corn that market analysts probably have the final expectation of something closer to 13 and a half or 13.2 or something like that for the size of the U.S. corn crop. Well, basically, the USDA, uh, through a combination of a little bit of downward adjustment in, in acreage and uh, this small change in the corn yield, dropped at 20 million bushels, which is, when you're talking about billions of bushels, not much. It just really does backload the figuring up of, of how this year's challenging weather and crop development conditions, how, how they're going to affect this year's crop. It really seems that the USDA, with, with an out-of-bounds out of, out of bounds year like this, are going to wait until we actually harvest the crop to give us finalized numbers. And with that, you would hope by the time we get to the early November crop production WASDE reports, which will represent November 1 numbers, that will have a better, better picture. But even then, we may not. It probably pushes uncertainty and worries about the size of of crops and having adequate supplies for both corn and soybeans, as well as grain sorghum and other crops that are affected. It could very well be that we'll have to wait till the uh, January crop production summary report comes out to really give the USDA enough uh, surety of information to uh, represent any final crop production shortfalls if they're there. 
So there you go. I, I would say, though, even though they were hesitant to make any production adjustments, the USDA did come in and, and show what's happening in the country, in the cash markets anyway, by raising the prices uh, that they're projecting. When you look at for corn, the USDA had been projecting $3.60 coming out of the September report. Here they raised that $0.20 to 380 for the October WASDE report, 380 per bushel for a national average price. Grain sorghum went from 330 to 340. Soybeans jumped from 850 to $9. Is a 50 cent increase in price. Now, some of that has to do with, uh, well, just looking at the world situation and wondering about the possibility of export flows one way or the other with, for soybeans and, and such. So that's all in there. For wheat in the wheat market, the USDA had been projecting for this marketing year, starting June 1, that we'd see prices about 480 a bushel. In the September report, they actually dropped that a dime for the U.S. wheat price, so down to 470. And, and that's, an, that's another prime example of, of how the current weather conditions that are being experienced for the last 20 to 30 percent of the hard red spring wheat, wheat crop are not shown in, in these the USDA numbers, probably because, you know, that happened after October 1. So there's, there's still a lot that will have to be reconciled in terms of problems that people can see in the field that will be affecting yields and production and even harvested acres. Again, final quantities of crops that we'll have to deal with and then, uh, and then where prices go from there. Now, the immediate market reaction yesterday, and particularly in the uh, corn arena, was triggered by the stocks numbers, Dan. And corn stocks were a little more plentiful than the market watchers had expected. Soybean stocks continuing to shrink, and there were the according responses in the trades. Yes. Corn uh, upfront months, the DS19 and the March contract uh, 2020, both down 14 cents. May down 13, July down 12. But then once you get out to Sept DS2020 harvest and, and beyond, it really changes of only three or four cents, almost in sympathy for what's happening in the upfront months. For soybeans, really not much change. Uh, the uh, November contract closed at 9.23 and, and a half, down a quarter of a cent. So not much change there. And on the uh, upfront wheat contract, 403 and a quarter is the close, down 10 cents. I think it would be really interesting to see what happens in, in coming days. Uh, it's not a surprise that when traders had pre-report expectations that they'd see different numbers than what the USGA came out with, and if they're guessing high on supplies, well, yeah, you, these type of changes you'd see. What would be really interesting, I think, is a storm rolls through and we get increasingly a, a better picture of, of the, how the harvests are going to work out for these crops here in the U.S. I would wonder how much lower prices could go. Now, as soon as you say that, you're really setting yourself up for problems because they could go, they could go any, anywhere the market wants to take them. But there are, are these issues that still have to be dealt with. And uh, I think, Eric, that... If there's any lesson in these reports is that we need, we market watchers, farmers, agribusiness firms, uh, people that come up with these pre-report estimates, we need to go ask the USDA how they're going to judge this uncertainty. Because for about three, well, about three reports in a row now, August, September, now October, the market has been anticipating that your problem's out in the field. Well, we'll see, surely we'll see the USDA lower production numbers. Well, all three times in a row, they've, they've said, no, we're going to assume normal weather all the way to the end. And uh, that's met with uh, in- incredulity, I guess, on the part of the, of the market. So I think at least I'm learning my lesson. They're not going to make any adjustment on an out-of-the-range year like this until they actually have something in the bin. And that's, that's a later fall type of a, of a determination. So... When it comes to harvest time, marketing strategy on the producer's part, and now we're going to see more disruptions in harvest progress because of this freeze that's rolling through much of Kansas, for sure, and other parts of the the western Corn Belt. It sounds as if patience would be a virtue here in waiting for an improved pricing opportunity, Dad. Well, if I believe what I just said, and if if, if there's accuracy in, in that if there's merit and accuracy in, in that perspective that, that the USDA is going to be, quote, backloaded in, in really figuring out what, what we have out there inside of the field. And, and if there are surprises, they're, they're as or, or more likely to be on the short crop side than on, on this side, then, 
then that would drive a person, uh, especially if they're in cash market, for cash market sales, probably if they harvest grain early, unless you're driven by cash flow needs, or I, I think what, what we are seeing in some areas is that local cash markets are offering very good basis bids. So if, if we have a, some good basis bids that are going contrary basically to what futures are doing, it would seem, Eric, your, your reasoning is right on, that uh, there would be merit and uh, probably wisdom at least in waiting to see how the uncertainty about the size of this crop works out, knowing that that if we end up with 162, 166 bushel per acre corn yield or a soybean yield of 44, 42, 44 for U.S. average instead of the 46 that they're projecting, that the numbers in January, February, even December could be tighter than what the market's looking at right now for the USDA official estimates, and that would be supportive of prices. So we shall see, but again, in closing, the wild card here may well be this weather system moving through, and and, uh, all bets may be off on production numbers, Dan. And corn maturity as of October 6th, 58%, and normally it's 85% at this time. We're not getting a lot of heat units right now, that's for sure. And for soybeans, normally we're sitting at at about 25% harvested. Now we're about 15, I guess, at this time. And we have cold temperatures descending upon a fair swath of the Corn Belt. So we'll see. Uh, just a lot of uncertainty to have to work through before we really know accurately where this market and these supply-demand numbers are going. It will be interesting as we push through this harvest season. Dan's notes on the grain markets, including his summary of the USDA's latest grain production and stocks report, can be found on agmanager.info out of K-State Agricultural Economics. Again, agmanager.info. Once again, we'll catch up with you next Friday, Dan. Many thanks. Thanks, Eric. Take care. He checks in with us each week to talk grain market trends, does grain market economist Dan O'Brien of K-State Research and Extension. We'll resume on agriculture today after this break over the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now. Understanding how the U.S. Department of Agriculture uses scientific research to establish food safety policies was the theme of a presentation this week on the K-State campus by the individual in charge of the USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service, or FSIS. Mindy Brashears was the guest of the Food Science Department here at K-State, and while here, she allowed us a few moments to visit. Her formal title is USDA Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety. Prior to assuming that post back in January, Mindy served as one of the nation's leading scientists in the food safety arena, working out of Texas Tech University. Among her accomplishments, evaluating interventions in pre- and post-harvest meat processing settings and on the emergence of antimicrobial resistance in medicated livestock feeding systems. So, as you'll be able to tell, she's very well versed in the food safety arena. Uh, Yes, I've spent my entire career studying food safety and really specifically applied food safety in meat and poultry products. So the transition on the scientific side and making data-driven and science-based decisions at FSIS has been very smooth and I've enjoyed that very much. 
And to explain, that's one of the primary roles, if not the primary role of the Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety to administer, oversee the functions of the Food Safety Inspection Service, correct? Uh, Yes. The FSIS, or Food Safety Inspection Service, is the only agency within the Office of Food Safety, and so I get to oversee that and oversee the safety of meat, poultry, and uh, egg products. And so it's a a great opportunity, and uh, I've enjoyed it very much so far. And something that you said in your presentation really resonated in that was it is all about science-based information at FSIS. Yes, it is. Um, I am fortunate that our decisions are definitely informed by years of science and uh, data and research. We have a wonderful team of scientists at FSIS. Uh, People think about FSIS and they think about our inspectors in the plants, but we have a very strong team of scientists that have uh, PhDs. Uh, Most of them have PhDs, Master of Public Health, and uh, they work very closely with me on risk assessment, microbiological needs policy, and many other areas. And so uh, data is of utmost importance to the agency. Well, as you spoke to the group here at K-State, you outlined four basic areas of emphasis currently with FSIS. And the first and foremost was about inspection and, and modernizing inspection processes. And that's happening at several levels, you say? Uh, yes, we have already implemented uh, our poultry inspection, our modernized poultry system. Uh, we're moving, uh, we announced our uh, pork modernized system uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we're excited to move forward in that to improve efficiencies in the system and really to focus on our food safety offline inspection activities. I do want to emphasize again that all of our carcasses will still have uh, inspection as well as our antemortem inspection of the live animals will still be occurring and overseen by our vet inspectors. I wanted to underscore that because you say as that in particular that pork inspection upgrade is occurring and will be occurring that there's been misinformation about how that'll manifest itself out there. Uh, Yes, there has. Um, There's been information that has come out and said inspection activities have been given to the establishment. No, that has not happened. USDA FSIS will oversee all inspection activities. We'll still have full inspection of all carcasses and animals. So some of the information that has uh, been put out there just isn't accurate and I really urge people to contact us and we have a lot of information that you can if you look into it yourself you can actually see what the truth is on uh, how the process works and there will be something of a subtle shift in how uh, the inspection fleet if you will will be structured within that upgrade of the pork inspection process? Uh, Yes, we will be focusing on our consumer safety inspectors, uh, which um, have more education and experience, and those will be the ones on the line doing our uh, carcass by carcass and our viscera and our head inspection on the line now uh, instead of our food inspectors. So there will be a shift there in that way. And if you talk specific pathogens, one of the primary ones on the pork side would be salmonella, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, we are really trying to take strong action against reducing uh, salmonella and specifically the public health impact uh, that we can have by reducing salmonella in the pork system. So we're moving toward our performance standards and we're really excited about that and look forward to uh, the, the impact that we'll have. Well, beef processing is big in this state, as you well know, and there are things on down the line expected to move and shake in that area of inspection as well? There is potential there. We have had companies that have applied for a waiver, uh, which means they'll operate under the new system under a waiver, and we'll see how that works. We'll follow that, um, move ahead, and make sure that, that everything is safe in that way. And then also we're moving toward beef performance standards on ground beef and beef trimmings with uh, salmonella. So again, we want to reduce those illnesses associated with beef products. We're talking beef briefly here. As an aside, E. coli was the headliner for years upon years at Texas Tech. You obviously worked in that arena as well. Great strides have been made against E. coli, although it's still in the crosshairs. Progress has been made at a fairly high level. Absolutely. Uh, we never want to just, you know, be overlook it and say we've solved this problem. We haven't. We still have um, our isolated outbreaks. We still have uh, issues with that. You know, you're never happy until you get to zero. But uh, we have made 
great strides, but we will continue to oversee this. We are expanding our testing of our, not just the E. coli 0157H7, which was the culprit, you know, 20 years ago. We've expanded that to six other different O groups, which cause the same illness. They just have a different uh, designation. And so we're going to expand our testing to include those because some of our illnesses are trending in that way. We want to get on top of that before it grows and causes any major uh, consumer problem. Mindy, I have to ask you about something else you brought up in your presentation, and that is the role that FSIS will play in laboratory-cultured, quote, meat products. We won't get into the weeds on that particular issue, but talk about what that role will be. Sure. Uh, we, uh, we will uh, share the regulatory oversight with the FDA. FDA will oversee pre-market approval and the cell lines that are used to produce a product. Once a product is made from that, we will oversee the actual food product. Uh, we'll establish a standard of identity so there's transparency to the consumer that this was lab-grown product. That'll be a public process for common when we get to that stage. And then any plant that produces this will have to have a grant of inspection. We'll have to have HACCP and SSOPs and follow all the regulatory guidelines of USDA. They'll have daily oversight in their plant. And so uh, we're looking forward to moving ahead on that as well. And don't want to overlook one other priority, and that is consumer information and education on handling, in the case we're talking here, meat products in a safe manner. All the protocols in the world will fall by the wayside if that isn't taken care of. Absolutely. Uh, The consumer is our last line of defense. Uh, We want to empower our consumers with information so they can keep their family safe. We do everything we can on the regulatory side in the plant, but we want our consumers to be able to know how to properly handle their foods. Um, You know, because we haven't had any major outbreaks and and catastrophic events with our food supply, uh, people kind of forget about it. They, in they might uh, not follow all the procedures that we recommend. So we want to encourage them to stay on top of that. And we also want to remind them that we have the meat and poultry hotline available and websites available for educational materials if they need uh, more information on how to properly handle meat and poultry products. Wrapping up here, Mindy, you've been in this position at USDA FSIS for not quite a year now. As you look forward, what do you perceive as to put it this way, the hot button issue coming forth in as far as food safety broadly and meat safety more specifically? Yeah, broadly, it's a hot button and it's been a hot button and that is really controlling salmonella. Salmonella consistently, uh, year after year, is either the number one or number two cause of bacterial foodborne illness identified by the CDC. And unfortunately, we have made no public health impact as measured by our Healthy People 2010, Healthy People 2020 goals. Our goal is to really impact the public health uh, consequences of having salmonella in our products. And this is uh, multifunctional across beef, pork, poultry products, and also empowering our consumers to handle the product safely so ultimately we can reduce those illnesses. It's not for lack of things to stay on top of at FSIS. Congratulations on your appointment, and thanks for sharing a bit about what's happening within the realm of that important service while you're visiting K-State. Good to have you here. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you and uh, to talk about food safety and keeping our food supply safe. That's USDA Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety, Mindy Brashears, offering that insight on some of the prime happenings, particularly in the area of meat safety inspections, during her visit to the Kansas State University campus earlier this week. You are tuned to Agriculture Today. We'll stand aside now for a few moments, and when we come back, a word from a K-State crop entomologist about watching for insect damage potential in that newly emerging winter wheat, and more still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online.
From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. As winter wheat emerges throughout Kansas, there are certain insects that might catch producers' attention. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist from K-State Research and Extension, advises producers on armyworms. There has been a little bit, and I have gotten a few calls about armyworms. We had quite a few armyworms early on in the spring in the brome uh, and in the wheat, and apparently uh, we're still seeing quite a few armyworms and fall armyworms. The, the thing I want you to know is under good growing conditions, you generally don't have to worry about treating armyworms, but if you have five or six per square foot and the growing conditions aren't good, they can retard the growth a little bit. They usually don't reduce the stands, but they will set it back. So it's a judgment call as whether you want to treat or hold off under growing conditions. That tissue, that plant replaces that tissue pretty quickly, and it's usually not a problem. But, you know, if, if plants are struggling, and I had five or six small worms, less than half an inch uh, per square foot, I would probably recommend treating that field just to clean it up, and it'll probably be good to go for three or four weeks. So we're probably, again, it's crapshoot based upon the weather, but we're probably only going to have one more generation of these things this year. Uh, if it gets cold, we won't have any more. We'll just have to wait and see what the weather does. And the difference between army worms, fall army worms, and the army cutworm is if it's an army cutworm, they will be out there and feed all winter. That's why it's important if you have worms in your wheat, get out and identify them. Take them to your local county extension office and let them identify them or take really good pictures and send them to us so we can identify them. If it's army worms, fall army worms, like I said, once it gets cold uh, down into the 20s, they're going to be gone. If it's an army cutworm, they're going to just go into hiding in the residue or in the cracks in the soil, and they will feed all winter long anytime it's over 45 degrees, and they will be there to feed in the spring. So and that's where a lot of times we get growers calling and say, hey, my wheat's going backwards in the spring. You know, it starts to green up, but then they start losing it. Lots of times that's army cutworm. That was crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth from K-State Research and Extension. For Agriculture Today, I'm Britton Rucker. Again, here's Eric. Thanks, Britton. The Kansas Department of Agriculture this morning announced it has updated its interactive map of Kansas showing the economic contribution of agriculture across the state, broken down by county. It's located on the KDA website. This interactive resource can be used to find the agricultural economic facts for each of the 105 counties in Kansas, as well as a report for the entire state. The KDA annually updates the statistics to provide an understanding of the influence of the 68 sectors of agriculture on the state's economy. Also, the reports include the indirect and induced effects of agriculture and the ag-related sectors, demonstrating the total impact that agriculture has in Kansas communities. The total economic contribution of agriculture, by the way, totals over $65 billion in this state, supporting more than 245,000 jobs statewide. The interactive map allows you users to see detailed agricultural statistics, including farm numbers, the leading agriculture cultural sectors and the value added data for each county. The KDA to come up with this utilizes data compiled by the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. The county statistics map is available at agriculture.ks.gov. For updated information, click on a county and find the 2019 full report for county after the county sector list. Again, that can be found at agriculture.ks.gov slash K-S-A-G. Have a look at that. A longtime prominent family in Kansas agriculture recently invested in the future of wheat production in the state with a major donation to the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation. This gift will support cutting-edge crop development research at the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center. Here's more from Marsha Boswell on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha. The Jack and Donna Veneer family continued their legacy of giving by donating $1 million to the future of wheat research. This gift to the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation will ensure a bright future for our state's most iconic crop. According to the Veneer family, 
Wheat is something that touches lives across the world every day, from the Kansas farmer to the suburban mom to children in developing countries. For our family, wheat is ingrained in our heritage and is a proud cornerstone of our business, so we are honored to give back to the industry that has blessed us with so much. In recognition of the Vineyard family's gift, the Kansas Wheat Alliance has named a new wheat variety, KS Western Star, a tribute to the Salina flour mill. John J. Vineer had a bold passion for the milling industry and, through saving and hard work, was able to afford a then-struggling Western Star Mill Company in 1925. As his business began to expand, so did his family, which includes Jack and Donna Vineer, as well as their children, Marty, Mary, and John, the generous individuals who have given a gift that will shape the Kansas wheat industry for years to come. The KS Western Star variety, which was developed at Kansas State University, will be available to farmers in fall 2020. This generous donation is a pillar of the Fields Forward campaign, which aims to fund research projects that improve yield and quality, develop and maintain technologies and facilities necessary for future wheat research, and cultivate new talent in the wheat breeding and genetics industry. According to Aaron Harries, Vice President of Research and Operations at Kansas Wheat, this gift will allow us to properly maintain and improve the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center, a facility that marks the largest investment by farmers in wheat research to date. This facility has hosted tens of thousands of visitors from around the globe over the last seven years, and it contains the future of wheat genetics in its laboratories and greenhouses. This donation gives our stakeholders peace of mind, knowing that the hub they have created for international wheat research will be maintained for years to come. Over the past half century, Kansas wheat farmers have contributed millions of their own hard-earned dollars toward wheat research through the wheat checkoff. The Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation was created to increase research funding above and beyond the resources of the wheat checkoff. And while the checkoff is paid only by farmers, the foundation allows private individuals and all segments of the wheat industry to support wheat research through tax-deductible gifts. With supporters like the Veneer family, the Kansas wheat industry will continue to honor the heritage that unites us all. For more information, visit fieldsforward.org. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Up for you now on Agriculture Today... Kansas Agricultural Weather and the update from the Weather Data Library here at Kansas State University. Over once again to visit is climatologist Mary Knapp of K-State Research and Extension. Mary, that freeze monitor on the Mesonet website, which we've talked of frequently, has to have been pretty busy this morning, what with what's moved into the state. Well, we certainly anticipate a lot of traffic on that page as people get in and, and check and see just how cold did it get and for how long. It should be noted in the western third of the state, we saw temperatures drop into the teens. There will be a number of those that set records as far as the low temperature goes. Our coldest reading so far was out in Wallace County with 13 degrees, which is pretty cold for anywhere in October. That's going to signal an end to the summer growing season in those areas. That's cold enough that it doesn't matter how long it stayed that cold. It's still cold enough that it's going to stop pretty much all uh, the vegetative growth. Now, it isn't as likely to have impact on the wheat because the temperatures are measured at five feet above the ground and the soils are still fairly warm and that will buffer that lower growing vegetation. 
Mesonet through the freeze monitor also tracks the duration of temperatures below 24 degrees, and that data is interesting, too. Right. A- again, and not surprisingly, in the areas where we had the lowest temperatures, we also have the longest period below 24. But we're looking at, um, in that northwest corner bordering Colorado, 8 to 9 hours below 24. As you move east, it's a little bit less in the Finney County area, about 4 hours below 24 once you get to the east of Finney County, it drops off considerably. There's a Scott County had about two hours of that, but you get over into the center part of the state, and it did not drop below 24. And freezing temperatures, not below 24, but below 32. What was the easternmost point overnight? Well, as of um, early this morning, about 8 o'clock um, central daylight time, that freeze mark had made its way as far east as Rock Springs in Dickinson County. We hit the 32 south of us in the Elmdale area, and it's likely that a couple of places have dropped colder than that, but that's pretty much the easternmost. Should be noted that even in the far east, um, we're talking anywhere from Brown County down to Cherokee County, they did drop below 40, and we're looking at 39, 38, 37, 36 for the low temperatures in those areas. So again, a fairly strong cold front that went through the temperatures below 40 are likely to have detrimental effects on the sorghum in particular, mm-hmm. not so much on the soybean, but uh, any sorghum that's still out there, it'll struggle to get back into active growth or development when it gets down below that 40 degree mark. And everybody in the state saw that. Now, before this cold blast moved through, we did have pretty substantial moisture in various places this past week, didn't we? We did, but again, um, it tended to be in areas that had already seen a lot of moisture. Um, Above normal moisture for most of the state, the exception in this last one was in the northwest, although the southwest did not see enough to erase the abnormally dry to moderate drought conditions that still prevail in that area. They did get some welcome moisture that will benefit wheat that is has been planted, but it still wasn't enough to erase the deficits. On the eastern part of the state where they have been inundated with moisture for most of the season, it put a halt to harvest that had been ongoing, uh, particularly corn has been waiting for some dry conditions. September was welcome. It was drier than normal for that area, and they actually were able to get into the field for a few weeks. Um, This has slowed things down again. Well, we're not going to be done with freezing temperatures yet. It sounds like there'll be another round this evening. Right. Um, As this front moves through, it's going to be replaced by some fairly dry air that there's very little moisture in this in the atmosphere that means those temperatures have a good chance of dropping below freezing again tonight after that things are going to moderate we're looking for highs in the 60s maybe 70s and lows in the 40s uh, going into next week so that will be uh, more seasonal and not that foretaste of winter And for those itching to get back into the field for harvest or wheat planting, open weather for the entire week, you say? At this point, it looks like it's going to be dry for the rest of the week. And that, again, will be welcome for those that are trying to get some harvest accomplished, get field activities done. We're looking at, again, seasonal temperatures in the middle 60s for highs and 40s for lows, sunshine and dry the quantitative precip forecast for the week ending next Friday is for zero precipitation across <laughs> across the state. And Pretty definitive, isn't it? <laughs> right. And again, it's been a while since that has been the condition. There is a slight chance for 
maybe a tenth of an inch or less in extreme eastern Kansas, and we're talking in the Leavenworth, Johnson, Wyandotte County areas, maybe a little bit south of that. But again, not a very strong chance and not huge amounts as this last front moves out in that eastern part of the state, they may see some moisture to to get that started. Go out a little bit further to the 8 to 14 day, and the temperatures are expected to hold as warmer than normal, but there is an increased chance for wetter than normal conditions. So after a dry week, we may have some moisture to help get those fall planted crops up and going. One area that we might want to watch is southwestern Kansas because the Storm Prediction Center is actually issued a slight chance for heavy precipitation in that region, and we'll have to see how that develops as time goes by. All right, and we appreciate the update, Mary. Thanks, as always. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp, climatologist, K-State Research and Extension, along with us each Friday. And that's our time for today and the week. Thanks to you for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.